Welcome to the Lazy CEO Podcast, where Jim Schlexer, author of Great CEOs Are Lazy and founder of the CEO Project, features compelling experts and topics for CEOs of mid to large size companies. Now, let's get started with the show. This podcast is brought to you by the CEO Project. At the CEO Project, we work with CEOs to help them grow their business. Uh, and our members represent billions of dollars of revenue and profit. And frankly, amongst all of us, we've probably made every mistake in the book, including some you haven't made yet. So if you want to learn from the experience of a bunch of really seasoned CEOs, we're a great place to hang out. In this podcast, what you're going to hear are some of those ideas, concepts, and things that are just going to help you on your journey. If you want to find out more, reach out to us at theceoproject.com, or you can contact me personally at jim at theceoproject.com. Happy listening. Well, welcome to the Lazy CEO Podcast. We're here with Joel Trammell. This is the second half of our conversation with Joel, and he and I have just been having so much fun that we decided to carry on uh, for a second podcast. So welcome in, uh, to the conversation. So we're talking about hiring um, and you know, sort of bringing on the right people and you know, exceptionalism. But what do you do when you get a clunker? Like you said, everybody makes mistakes. I've made plenty in my hiring, you know, decisions. What do you, what are the steps you would take humanely and appropriately for both the person and the organization to exit them? Or, or what do you do? Maybe exit isn't the answer. Maybe it's something else first. Well, the first thing is, you know, do you have any kind of overlying management system in place? Um, and what I mean by that is things like, uh, you know, do you require your managers to have a one-on-one -on -one coaching relationship with every employee? So, you know, all my managers, I required them to have weekly meetings with each of their direct reports, maybe only 15, 30 minutes, but a weekly conversation. I told them they are in a, you should be in a coaching relationship with every person you manage. And yep. uh, one of the other things I told them that often caused them to get a little wide-eyed was understand that when somebody works for you, you are the first or second most impactful person in their life. And a lot of managers don't think about that, uh, how important they are in their employees, you know, because you're controlling their career, their salary, their where they work, I mean, all kinds of things. They're, and then you're the person they go home and gripe to the spouse about. <laughs> uh, all of those things are really important. So first of all, do you have managers that are trained to know how to manage people? Second thing, onboarding every employee requires training when they start. Okay. You can't, I call it micro training. Anytime you, you bring an employee in and have them do something, if you have an opinion on how that should be done, you have to micro train them on that. You don't get to hire people and assume they're just going to figure it out for themselves. That's not fair to the employees. If I do that, if I just throw somebody into something, and they don't do it the way I like, then I don't know where the problem is. Mm -hmm. so, I, so I have to build a, a very competent onboarding and training program to be successful. Then the third component is, do I rate the employee? We rated the employees every quarter, every manager rated every employee, A, B, or C in the organization. And you know I would review those rankings for my managers uh, and the managers below would review for, for their managers to make sure they were setting a good, and consistent bar. Right. Now, if you're doing all those things, then if somebody got rated a C two quarters in a row, I was in the manager's office going, hey, you know, why haven't we moved on? That's, you know, kind of two quarters. If we're doing all the other things we should be doing, we've trained them up front. They're not being successful. Uh, it's time to move on. The other thing I did, because I personally didn't want anybody to be fired in my organization without uh, being aware that they had an issue, is every time there was a C anywhere in the organization, I would go by that person's office and say, hey, I just want you to know your manager needs uh, has expressed that you have to improve your performance if you want to remain here. I just want to be clear that you know that because I, even though I told the managers, if you write somebody a C, tell them that, I wanted to confirm <laughs> right. that that message had been communicated. <laughs> you know, I used to ask the question, somebody says, hey, I got to go fire Joel. I go, you fire anybody you want. I got one question. 
If I walked down to Joel's office right now and said, do you realize you're going to be fired in the next five minutes? Would he be surprised? And if they go, well, I'm, I, I don't know that he would expect it. And I go, then you haven't done your job. That's right. And you're not allowed to fire him until he knows where he sits and why he sits there. And that if it, if, when the thing comes down, he goes, I didn't really want this to happen, but I understand why. And I knew it was coming. Then you've done your job as a leader. Um, and I think that's where a lot of the failures are. They don't, that, that weekly sit down, that coaching conversation, it never happens because people want to keep right. it nice and friendly. They won't have the hard conversation because um, that's uncomfortable. Um, that's right. So let's go over to business model design for a little bit. And, and you've done a, a variety of different kinds of businesses, some with recurring revenue, some without recurring revenue, which is what I usually claim is the number one most important thing. But how do you think about what's a good business and what's a bad business? And, and, and this could come from, you know, either I want to invest in it and make, make it becomes investable or and it, maybe it's not business model. Maybe it's just talent. And then, and or what businesses would you ever be interested in starting up or becoming involved in personally? So how do you think about business model and what's a good business and a bad business? Well, and it, you know, I think stage certainly, you know, makes a big difference. I mean, I've spent a lot of time in the startup world. Um, you know, there it's all about the product market fit, right? Can I, can I build a product? Can I sell it and not run out of money? And that's all you need to concern yourself until you've solved that problem. Uh, yeah. and, and so that's different. So in that area, I'm always looking for things that I think are easy to sell uh, because the building stuff, usually people can do that. Uh, but can you figure out how to sell it in a way that, that makes sense? Because you can't sell, uh, you know, uh, 50 cent pieces for a dollar. Uh, it, it doesn't work. You know, if you got to spend a dollar. Well, you, you can. It's just not a yeah. very good business model. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's not, not sustainable. And, uh, yeah. you know, there's a lot of a lot of businesses that try to move down market or something. And and you say, oh, yeah, the numbers would work. But the problem is it costs to acquire our customers the same down market as it is up market. You're getting a lot less money for them. Um, now, you know, once you get past that, and I think it's uh, also, you know, just my biases. So I've sold into businesses almost exclusively. So I would I would not look at a consumer oriented thing. I don't think I understand why consumers buy necessarily unless it was something targeted directly at my demographic. Uh, so I'm a business to business guy. Uh, generally, broad technology uh, is where I feel like I have some value. I do did have an engineering degree and at one time could do a little bit of that. Uh, that was a long time ago, but, <laughs> but can understand technical concepts and think that's helpful. Uh, you know, what I say for CEOs is is the qualifications for a CEO, you have to understand deeply how the product is made and you have to understand deeply why and how the product is bought. Those are the two kind of components. And within that, then, you know, you can have a pretty wide range of things. But there are certainly more businesses that I would look at and go, not me, I don't understand it, I, you know, than, than there are the other way. Interesting. So let, let's pick on one that you did that didn't work out the way you would have liked to, which is mm -hmm. chorus. So, yep. and, and that may have, I mean, you may have already picked on it, which is how it gets bought and the ease of selling is really where that one, because it seemed like a phenomenal idea. You know, So talk about like, what did you learn from that experience? Didn't turn out quite the way everybody wanted to. Yeah, we all love particularly you, and I know you put a lot of money into it. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, we we all love talking about our one failure, you know. But uh, well, I'll, uh, I'm happy to talk about the the another one that went very well. So <laughs> we'll do this yeah. one first. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah. So th there, the you know, there were several things. Um, you know, one that was the uh, one of the only ones that I've done. I think probably the only one I've kind of really started and 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 really scaled that I didn't have a partner in. Mm. Uh, which is kind of interesting. I mean, one of the things that uh, uh, if you kind of look at the history of startups and stuff, uh, two seems to be a little bit of a magic number. A lot more of the successful startups were done by two people than one or three. Uh, um, and so, uh, you know, that was a piece. I didn't have anybody to compliment, uh, you know, my skills. Um, I've never felt like I was a great salesperson. And, and so that's, you know, maybe a piece if I'd had the right sales partner or something, maybe that would have happened. Uh, Chorus was interesting in that it demoed very well. Yeah. Uh, it was software platform for CEOs. 
And, you know, the demos were off the charts. I mean, people would get really excited and say that's how they want to run their organization. The challenge came in getting from that step to implemented in the organization because it required some discipline. It required the CEO saying, hey, this is the way we're going to do things. And even if you on my team don't quite see why we're doing this, it's really important for me. Uh, and and so that was really the challenge. Um, you know, obviously we were ahead. I think one of the things I tell people in technology all the time, it's pretty easy to figure out where technology is going to go. It's really hard to get the timing just right. I mean, electric vehicles, people think like Tesla and banned electric vehicles. No, GM was building electric vehicles 100 years ago, yeah. you know, but finally the, the right combination of things came together. Was that luck or skill? A little hard to tell, right? Um, but they, you know, clearly right place, right time. And so timing's so important to this. I have no doubt, you know, the fundamental premise of Chorus was we've set up software for every executive on most teams. Sales guys got Salesforce, marketing person has their HubSpot or whatever. There's a platform that every executive uses to run their part of the business, except the CEO. Will yeah. the CEO at some point in time have software to run their business? Absolutely. Uh, it wasn't yet Chorus. Uh, but I think, you know, at some point 10 years from now, somebody will produce something, probably look very similar, and everybody will go, oh, that's it. And it'll catch the magic, you know, tipping point, and, and we'll be there, and we'll go, oh, gosh, we invested a bunch of money building that 20 years ago, <laughs> but it didn't work. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, it worked. It just it wasn't ready. You know, it feels yeah. like yeah. Yeah. technology, your answer is be a fast follower is a better strategy than being the first one out of the breach, right? It, it um, often is, Absolutely. So let's go to the other side. You, you know, you had a business where, um, I mean, I'll just sum it up and say you found the right buyer. Um, so <laughs> um, I'll give you, we can talk about the good ones too. Um, yeah. so what was the secret there? I mean, it was an interesting product around data storage management. Um, and, you know, I don't know that it was ever going to be the scale it ended up being. It just, you caught lightning. Or is there something more strategically that you did there that got it to that place? Yeah, so I think, you know, that was a case where it was, you know, technology was going to develop. And the fundamental, you know, technology was, hey, there's this transition that's happening between spinning platter hard disk and solid state devices. Okay. And solid state storage devices are much faster and everybody knows the world will move there, but they're, of course, much more expensive. And so how do you make that transition was the fun, underlying kind of fundamental business problem. It was a hard technical problem to solve, and that's what attracted me. So I bought the assets of a failed startup, uh, and what attracted me and had me you know, get involved was this is a hard problem, and they have a team built together that can actually solve it. And that's, you know, that's something I'm always interested in when you ask what kind of business. If you've got some really hard technical challenge, but you've already gathered the group of people that's, the, you know, maybe not the only people in the world that can solve it, but one of the few limited groups that has the right talent set and experience to solve the problem. Usually, the, as a business guy, you ought to be able to figure out how to make money with that. Right. And so that was kind of the premise when I invested was, I think we've got some great talent here that can solve a problem that very few people in the world can solve now my job is to go figure out how to return value with that and so that 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 was kind of the premise now we absolutely got very lucky because we were in the first quarter of business but we were going to generate and i actually told my sales guy to stop selling in the first quarter of business because we got approached and they didn't want to carry on the business mm. and he actually sold he actually sold something he wasn't supposed to sell kind of a funny story i just it, there was this company in France that wanted to buy. And I told him, well, we're not available for export. You know, gave all these excuses, you know, and they just sent in an order. And he walked into my <laughs> office sheepishly and like, uh, I'm sorry, boss. Uh, you know, I said, you're the worst sales guy ever. You can't even not sell something. What I <laughs> That's funny. But anyway, we were going to generate, you know, probably a half million. You should have responded, orders. Joel, Joel, it's not sell selling when they just send me orders. <laughs> like, I'm yeah, just sitting yeah, there. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, we were going to generate, you know, half million in revenue or something in the first quarter of business. So we had something that was, you know, an interesting product. But we had a technology because we had done something that was really hard to do that somebody else had tried to do and failed. A large company had tried to do it. They had spent a bunch of money and failed. 
and it was getting to the point where it was going to significantly impact their future revenue if they didn't deliver this technology to the market. And so they bought us for the technology. And at that point, I kind of knew how big a bind they were in. Uh, and so it was pretty easy to drive a big, what I thought was an exorbitant price, a uh, hundred million dollar uh, number on, you know, again, 400, 500,000 in revenue in one I'm, quarter. I'm going to support yeah. the word exorbitant. Yeah, that's a good word. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. yes. I, I don't, I never calculated a multiple. The IRR for investors was 221%, wow. you know, uh, they got seven times their money in 18 months. Uh, you know, that that one doesn't happen very often. That was certainly lucky. Uh, but again, I think kind of the core learning there is if if you have something that's hard to do that you think, you know, could have a lot of value that uh, in the market uh, solving that technical challenge and you've got one of the teams that can do it, that can that can usually be leveraged. You know, it's interesting when people go, it's a really hard problem. I go, goody. That's yeah. a great answer because if we can figure it yeah. out. It's going to be hard for everybody else. It's a barrier. It's a natural barrier to entry for everybody else who yeah. tries to solve the problem. So I, I like hard, just like you do. Hard problems are good problems yeah. because if you can solve them, there's money to be made and it's a defensive barrier to anybody going back. What about, um, you know, I had a debate recently about patentability. And, and I gotta, I'll just start with, I have a bias against patents because I don't see why I should tell you how I did it just to try to, and particularly in technology, you know, the life cycle is just so short that a patent is almost irrelevant. And, so, but but maybe you have a different thought about the asset value of a patent, um, you know, in in the businesses you've been involved in. Do you skew towards protection of intellectual property? Or you just keep it trade secret. How do you think about that? Um, I maybe maybe a little bit in the middle. Uh, I I think patents can have other values. They can have market value. Uh, you know, uh, as a as a show that you've actually done something. Because in a lot of these technologies, it's really hard for the customer to figure out whether you've really done something or not, right? Because they, if, if they knew how to do it, they would have done it. Uh, and so th there can be value in a kind of in a marketing sense. But yeah, I agree from a defensibility perspective, you know, just get out there and do it fast and do it before everybody else and keep in, in, incrementally improving it. And uh, you'll be way ahead. I mean, you know, a perfect example, Tesla, I mentioned earlier, they've, they've basically told everybody exactly what they've done. They've released uh, almost all their patents. Uh, and the, you know, when the Germans tore apart their car a few years ago, they went, Oh my gosh, they're two, three years ahead of us in, uh, in engineering, which mm -hmm. is the hard part. It was not, what are we doing? The hard part was how do we build it? <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and they were way ahead. And then you've seen that they've maintained that advantage. They still build the best electric car in the world. Yep. Well, that's why, you know, you, you, you partially persuaded me to go for a Tesla, but, um, yeah, and that was really my argument. They're so far ahead of everybody. It's gonna, it, as long as they continue to invest, they'll stay that far ahead. Nobody yeah. can catch up as long as they keep the the pedal down. So um, that's right. I I agree with that. Um, so maybe just jump over to when you start working with a CEO. What are sort of the top three or so things that you see as you know areas they really need to work on, or deficiencies they come to the table with, or blind spots that they have that like this this is. We got to fix this, or you're going to have a big problem on your hands. What are the top sort of three that you observe? Yeah, I, I think number one, we kind of mentioned it earlier that uh, people tend to come from a bias of a functional area, yeah. right? They tend to come from a sales bias or a finance bias or whatever. You know, one of the things that I think was helpful in my career is I just started the first business at 25 and had to learn a little bit about everything. I was keeping the books, and so I went and read an accounting book and. You know, I was doing sales and I was doing marketing and, and everything. And so I learned a little bit about everything. And so I didn't bring that bias to the table. But I see a lot of organizations that are just so heavily biased to one area or the other that the, it's like a lopsided wheel. The, the organization just doesn't yeah. get. Just quickly, I'm working with a company like that right now. And they're frankly in a little bit of financial distress. And uh, the CEO is a sales guy. And so the right. story we've been hearing for two years is I'm going to sell my way out, sell my way out, sell my way out, sell my way out. We're going to grow out. And we're like, it's not happening. We've got to go to the other side of the equation because let's look at the cost profile. Let's look at the structure. Let's look at the margin. That's where we're going to get home because selling out isn't working, but he, he can't see any other answer, you know, that because it's back. Yes. Sorry, just reinforcing yep. the point. Yep, absolutely. 
Um, so that's probably the number one thing. Um, and then there's, you know, kind of the fundamental question, is that what you want to do? Do you want to, you can be the sales guy and be the founder and bring in somebody else as CEO. I mean, that's okay. That's the right answer if you don't want to do it. Does that ever um, work? Does that ever work though, really, Joel? I certainly, maybe sales is not the, the best example. No, I know I've seen, yeah, I've certainly seen organizations that had sales founders that kind of, you know, spend all their time externally and, and, and let a CEO run the organization. Technologists, it works because they tend to want to be in the bowels anyway and out of the thing. Uh, you know, some, some might argue that's what my wife did with NetQOS was she hired a CEO yeah. and she did all the important technology stuff. That would be one way to view the, the outcome. Uh, so yeah, I think that could happen. Um, so that's the, that's the first thing I see. Um, you know, second, I think is the transition between product market fit. Hey, can I build a product? Can I sell it? And, uh, can I do that without running out of money? That's pretty simple. Most people uh, that are smart can, can manage that kind of process. But the transition from that to managing a company, where it, really the only way to sustainably grow a company is master the ability to hire and make productive, talented people. Mm. You can't just sell more forever. <laughs> you can sell more for a quarter or two and grow a business. But at some point, you got to deliver more you got to service more customers. You got to account for it. You got, and it's a whole vicious cycle. And so a lot of people struggle with that transition. They think they're in the software, you know, business or whatever. When really as CEO and you move to scale past, you know, the first 25 or 30 people, you're really in the people business as the CEO. Other people, software is part of it, but it's only one or two components out of six of what you're tra having to do to be successful as an organization. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, I, I've talked about, you know, the five hats, right. That in my book, uh, great CEOs are lazy mm -hmm. of, 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 of um, player going in and immersing yourself, learner or analyst trying to understand the business architect, designing coach talent and engineer processes and systems. And you're really, and, and I've said before, I said, you know, if I had to pick one hat you could run the entire business off of, it's the coach hat, which is really what you're saying, right? It's yeah, you get the right. right people and you get them in the right place. You can just sort of sit back and let them do their thing. Yeah. And, and you know, sit back is, is maybe the, the yeah. wrong analogy, uh, but it's not <laughs> being in the middle of every everything either, but it, it's being, it's being very smart about picking the strategic objectives and the direction of the organization. I think that's, you know, right. if you get that right with the right people, you're picking the right things, then it is, you can be the lazy CEO uh, as, as opposed to the one who's running around crazy all the time. Uh, you, you have to absolutely be involved in, in picking those right strategic objectives. I means you've got to know what's going on in the industry with customers, with employee, everything. Uh, and, and, you know, these days you've got to, be in an agile uh, framework where you're constantly changing things because the world's constantly changing. Right. Uh, and uh, but it is very different than the way most people uh, take on the CEO role and do the CEO role, which I call a firefighter. Uh, you know, which is just you know, here's the fire of the day, and I'm going to go deal with that. And and so you know, I, I say CEO, good CEO should be spending eighty percent of their time managing the future, twenty percent on stuff that's going on. In the present, most CEOs spend 100 percent of their time on stuff that's happening today or yesterday. Mm. Yeah, we we call that uh, peanut buttering your time, right? Sort of just smearing right. it across the whole business, sort of uniformly, which means nothing interesting ever happens because you haven't focused your attention on you know bringing it somewhere. Um, well, let let's end on this. So, Joel, if people want to get a hold of you guys, sort of have a, a an education program, a year long engagement that you offer for CEOs or possibly succession candidates to help them really start thinking like a CEO, become a better CEO. Um, right. How would they get a hold of you if somebody was interested in doing that and uh, engage? Which, by the way, what Joel does is very different to what we do with ongoing peer group, part of your infrastructure on an ongoing basis. This is more interventional, but I think super valuable. So how would they get a hold of you if they wanted to do something like that or put one of their leaders in place? Sure. Uh, American CEO is the website. American CEO, pretty simple to remember. Uh, and uh, yeah, we, we think of ourselves as what 
you know, most people go to MBA school for and don't get. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, with, uh, what they think they're going for is to learn how to run a business. Uh, and what they get is a bunch of analysis tools that could be helpful if that's your business, if that's what you need to do in a job, but is not how to run an organization, uh, particularly at scales. So, yeah, we're very much a training organization, uh, not a peer group organization. Right. And I think we're very complimentary in that regard. So if anybody needs or thinks they have somebody who'd be appropriate for that, American CEO, Dole and his partners will be happy to help you. And uh, I can guarantee you, they'll, you will, they will come out different on the other end than they went in. Guaranteed. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, well, awesome, Joel. Uh, it was as fun as we thought it would be. I really appreciate you taking the time and uh, look forward to talking to you in the near future. Thanks a lot, man. Thanks for listening to the Lazy CEO Podcast. We'll see you next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes and check out our website, www.theceoproject.com.